on the morning of October 17th, 1781, at around 10 a.m., a British drummer and a British officer would rise from the British Hornwork in her defenses uh, in and around Yorktown under the white flag of truce. This would spark the beginning of the end for the British here at Yorktown. Once the French and American forces saw the British white flag of truce, now terms of surrender had to be discussed. And the location for those terms of surrender would be discussed right here at the Moore House. We're about several hundred yards behind the American lines, and this house would remain untouched during the fighting. Some say that this house was chosen due to its close proximity to the battlefield, yet the luxuries that it would provide to the British, American, and French officers who would discuss the terms of surrender. Now, once the surrender was first recognized, Washington only gave the British about two hours to accept his terms. Well, the next day on October 18th, both sides would agree to meet here. Each side would have two representatives. Now, representing the British would be Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Dundas and Major Alexander Ross. On the American side, you would have Lieutenant Colonel John Lawrence, and for the French, you would have second colonel, Viscount de Noailles, who was Marquis de Lafayette's brother-in-law. Those four dignitaries, or representatives, I should say, would meet right here in this room. That very room is where the British, Americans, and French would discuss the terms of surrender and secure America's independence. Now, unfortunately, the Moore House is closed here today. Um, and we aren't, we aren't able to go inside, but I'll do my best to try and tell this story. But man, this is just a beautiful house. And just to be here is a really cool feeling, knowing what happened just inside the room here. Now, within those terms of surrender were 14 articles of capitulation. And a few of the articles would mention one field officer for every 50 men was allowed to reside near their respective regiments to witness their treatment and deliver clothing and other necessities to the camps. All other officers were paroled and allowed to go back to Europe, New York, or any other American post then in possession of the British forces, on the condition they would no longer fight until properly exchanged. Another article referred to the surrender ceremony and contained the provision that deprived the British of the honors of war. Customary honors allowed the surrendering troops to march out of their works with their regimental flags flying and playing an enemy's tune in honor of the victor. George Washington was not going to allow these honors. Instead, he stated, the same honors will be granted to the surrendering army as granted to the garrison at Charleston in May of 1780. Now what he's referring to is an American army was captured at Charleston, South Carolina, and they were not given the honors of war. So therefore, this was Washington's way at getting back at the British for those uh, actions. The article also read, the troops were to march out with shouldered arms, colors cased, and drums beating a British or German march. Then they were to lay their arms on the ground and return to their encampment, where they will remain until they were dispatched to places of their destination. So those were just a handful of the articles that were hashed out in this very house. Now once the articles were agreed upon, both sides returned to their respective camps, and the British would return to Yorktown and assemble their men, and they would begin to march what we now call Surrender Field. So that is our next destination. So the Articles of Capitulation were finally agreed upon on October 19th. Well, on October 20th, the British would march out of Yorktown, 7,000 strong, and they'd march to this very field behind us. And this is called Surrender Field. And they would march this way, their column stretching all the way to Yorktown, over a mile long, and they'd begin to lay down their arms. And uh, I don't know about you, I'm pretty excited right now, so let's have a closer look and see what we can learn. So here is Surrender Road, as you can call it. 
So on either side of this road, you would have the Americans on one side, the French on another, and the British forces would walk down the middle of this road. And they would begin stacking their muskets, turning in their swords, their colors would be covered. And after they would turn in their weapons here, they would march back to Yorktown. And from there, they would be sent to various places throughout the colonies. Now, something that's important to note is General Cornwallis did not lead his troops out of Yorktown. He claimed that he was ill that day. Well, instead, he put Brigadier General O'Hara in charge of the troops and he would lead the British column through this road to surrender the British forces. Think about what was going through the minds of the Continental soldiers, the French soldiers, and Washington himself. This is a man that had some ups and many downs during this period of American history. There were times where his army didn't have money, his army was frozen, starving, and even mutiny. And in spite of all that, he kept the bulk of the army together to fight another day. And it finally paid off. You can just imagine how exhausted Washington and the army was. And to finally have this moment where independence was in sight, uh, you, I can't imagine what Washington was thinking right now. So we're making our way up to the observation deck here that overlooks Surrender Field. And uh, it looks pretty awesome, so I'm excited about this. Wow. So here we are overlooking Surrender Field and the very road that the British would come down. And here's a rendering of what that scene would have looked like that day. So obviously there were very different emotions from both sides, but here is General Washington's account. I have the honor to inform Congress that a reduction of the British Army under the command of Lord Cornwallis is most happily effected. And that was to the President of the Continental Congress on October 19th of 1781. And on October 20th of 1781, and Lieutenant General Charles Lord Cornwallis would state, I have the mortification to inform your excellency that I have been forced to give up the posts of York and Gloucester and to surrender the troops under my command by capitulation on the 19th instant as prisoners of war to the combined forces of the American and French armies. And that was to Sir Henry Clinton, commander in chief of the British forces in America. So we've made our way from the observation deck here and we're making our way around to the trophies of war, as this is dubbed. And these are artillery pieces that were surrendered here at Yorktown. Wow. And some of them are even engraved. This one says, surrendered by the capitulation of Yorktown, October 19, 1781. <laughs> that is neat. Wow. Looks here, we have a howitzer. And a few more pieces here. You can kind of see some of the engravings here on the this field gun here. This one says, surrendered by the, it's hard to read. Anyway, it says, Surrendered, Capitulation of Yorktown, 1781. And then this one here. I believe it says more of the same. That is interesting. So these were field pieces of the British Army that were surrendered here on Surrender Field. So, obviously word didn't travel as fast as it does now. And word would reach England of Cornwallis' surrender here about a month later. And in fact, in November, uh, word would reach Lord North in England, and he just simply said, Oh God, it is all over. And that just shows the state of the British Empire and the support that this war truly had back at home. Uh, this war was bearing a terrible cost, not only financially, but in the human aspect as well. And the will to fight on the British side was diminishing by the day. Now, although after the surrender here at Yorktown would take an additional two years for the Treaty of Paris to be signed in 1783, the actions here at Yorktown effectively sealed 
America's independence. This was the last major engagement of the American Revolution. Another great thing about getting up early and shooting some history content, you get to have great conversations with the locals. Just sitting there chilling. <laughs>